When you have a successful video game franchise that releases a new title every single year, it is easy for the developers to get into a loop of making their games always feel too similar to the last. Call of Duty I think is a great example of that. And yes, you may love or hate the new titles, that does not matter here, but you have to give the credit to the developers at the Creative Assembly for being able to evolve their games almost every single year. From something as simple as Shogun Won't Talk to War with its board game style of gameplay, to introducing the 3D system in Rome Talk to War, to entering into a completely different era, reimagining their old titles into the new formula, new engines and eventually dipping into the creative juices provided by the Warhammer series and Three Kingdoms Talk to War. It is difficult to make the argument that each game is similar to its last two or three. The story of the Creative Assembly begins in 1987, 12 years before Talk to War hit the stars. The founder was a man named Tim Ansell. The company began by porting games from old computer systems onto newer ones. To put it into a more modern sense, kind of like a specific company who can turn your console game into a PC game, but they also made some additional fixes and changes. After that, they got a deal with EA and created games under EA Sports, such as Rugby World Cup and 1999 Cricket World Cup. The company's success with these games gave them the backing to take a risk. In addition, the games such as Command and Conquer and others like it also became popular. This was a genre CA wanted to get involved in, and so Shogun 1 Talk to War was born. They used part of their engine from old sports games, which programmed many players to be on the sports field at once, and turned it into a Talk to War battlefield. The company started off as a group of two, Tim Ansell and Michael Simpson as creative director. Over a year, the team was built up to 10 people. They took a big technological leap with the implementation of a basic 3D battle system, and most games back then were still 2D. Shogun Talk to War was meant to be a 2D battle simulator with small dots, rather than uh, 2D troops on a 3D battle map. After that, the game transformed away from a Japanese Command and Conquer clone into the Total War format we know today. Initially, it was just meant to be a game with some interesting battles. However, Simpson described them as being too short and unfulfilling afterwards. Hence, the creation of the campaign, to give the battles some form of meaning. But why did they choose the Shogun Sengoku period? Well, three reasons. One, they liked the fact that the campaign could easily have been made balanced, as any faction at the start could have won. Two, the introduction of gunpowder, which made the text tree much more exciting and increased the pace of the game. Three, Simpson thought it was a cool time period to look into. To increase historical accuracy, the devs recruited a historian onto the team, Stephen Turnbull although a lot of the inspiration also came from film. They even used information from Sun Tzu's The Art of War and built it into the AI to create its strategy. The demo was a huge success, preparing the devs mentally for a massive launch that was about to hit. Shogun 1 received great reviews, 200,000 copies sold in the UK alone and similar sales in the United States as well. And this, remember, was released in the year 2000 by a small dev studio. Tim Ansell described it as not being the most popular, but at least it got up there with the big guns. It was nominated for Best War Game of 2000 and again in 2001, but lost both. The game, however, did win a, an award for its soundtrack, Good job to Jeff Van Dyke for creating that. The Computer Gaming World magazine described the game as There has never been a game that so stunningly depicts historical warfare. And I am quite sure that this could again be said for any Talk to War title. Each stunningly depicts historical warfare. 
sounds kind of like a perfect success story. Immediately after its success, CA broke away from their publishers EA and brought on board Activision as their publisher and distributor. Just after the launch of Shogun, CA began work on a new title, Crusader Total War, which was soon changed to Medieval Total War. This was done for two reasons, one, to widen the scope of the game, and two, the events of 9-11 occurred uh, mid-development and the word Crusader was seen uh, to be too much of a risk. It was to work in a very similar way, just under a different setting. Medieval 1 smashed Shogun 1 in sales, and for the first two weeks of launch, it became the most selling game in the UK. They won the PC Game Developer of the Year award in 2003. The game released with an expansion called Viking Invasion. It also was updated with a free battle map available to download on, on Wargamer, which focused on the Battle of Stamford Bridge. This, in a way, would be the first DLC or free LC to be released by CA and one of the very first free LCs for a strategy game ever. With two successful titles under the name, a famous publisher and distributor brand on their side, and improved technology, CA began work on a game that would revolutionise strategy gaming, introducing 3D unit modelling and a 3D campaign, it was a major leap for gaming. Rome Total War After Medieval, CA reached a team of 20 and were looking for the era of their next title. During the planning stage, many films were releasing or starting production based on the theme of Rome, such as Gladiator. CA saw this and expected a sudden Rome trend to emerge. Although such a trend never really did rise up, I guess Rome's always been popular, but it's never like, been trending. Uh, that did not happen, but still it did not hinder the release of the game. The engine had been worked on since medieval, meaning the basic planning of the features stretched back all the way to just finishing Shogun. Very early in the game's development, CA tried to get a spot on E3. The game was still in its early stage, pre-alpha, so Activision refused to give them the spotlight. The devs behind CA purchased their own small section at E3, tried to get as many people down there to see it as possible, and boom. It won strategy game of the show. Activision was impressed, and that impressed feeling seemed to continue on to everybody afterwards. The success from this drew the eyes of two particular TV channels, the History Channel in the US and the British BBC2, creating both decisive battles of the ancient world and time commanders. This gave the game a massive promotional boost, helping further its successful launch. Not only this, but it was advertised alongside the expansion of Viking Invasion, which contained a built-in promotional video. And it was also heavily promoted through magazines. I got into a conversation with one of my uni supervisors about video gaming magazines not too long ago, and she was shocked that gamers no longer received their information uh, about video games through magazines, and we got it from the internet now, and yeah, she was of course quite shocked by that. Uh, just shows how much the scene has changed over time. The launch of the title was a success, although a few people commented claiming it ran poorly at first, and version 1.0 was clunky, but this improved with later patches. However, most claimed it to run well. The game sold hundreds of thousands of copies in the first years and generated millions for the dev studio and Activision, winning many awards. People were getting their hands on this game through many different means, through friends, watching older family members play, or something called an internet cafe. Finally, something about the old titles that makes me feel young. What is an internet cafe? <laughs> like Rainer here, I also played the tutorial and immediately fell in love with the game. After just playing the tutorial alone, I remember thinking then and there 
This is the greatest game ever, just from the tutorial. Speculation arose that Activision was planning on buying the Creative Assembly altogether. However, in March 2005, there was an odd twist. The company was bought by Sega, who wanted to boost their European gaming influence. They funded the release of two expansions, Barbarian Invasion and Alexander, both of which took the game into a new and unique direction, giving it a fresh feel. Under this new branch, they also were able to create a console game, Spartan Total Warrior, which was a console spin-off of Total War, but it never lived up to their Total War titles. CA had succeeded, the money was there, but they were not done yet. Medieval 2 Total War went into development. The studio felt they had unfinished business with the time period. The focus was to improve the graphics and gameplay to make it more realistic. This included unique unit faces and more accurate combat animations. On top of this, the soldiers acted more like people, having a look around and scratching their butts uh, whilst just being idle, stuff like that. Again, like Rome, I received comments about it struggling on launch, but seemed to get fixed with later patches. Again, like Reina, my first Medieval 2 experience was the same. The graphics were too good, my PC could barely handle it, but I played it nevertheless. Although Tom here is talking about Viking Invasion, my installation of Medieval 2 Tots War Kingdoms on my very old PC was a fiasco. I remember it to this day, I only had enough room to install two of the four campaigns. I chose Britannia and Crusades. It took 10 hours plus and did not even load. <laughs> the game yet again beat its own release record. It has gone down as the greatest in the franchise, with the greatest soundtrack composed by Jeff Van Dyke and is still played daily by thousands of players around the globe. Whether that be the base game, the expansion Medieval 2 Kingdoms Start to War, or the variety of fan-made mods that kept this game alive so many years on. In 2006, Sega released a collection of Total War titles called Total War Eras, featuring Shogun, Medieval and Rome Total War. Included in this was a 40 minute documentary about the early days of the Creative Assembly. Much of my information was actually taken from this documentary. However, there was another thing that I saw in there which just proved how great the team at the Creative Assembly were. How forward thinking, innovative and ahead of their time the studio was. In this 2006 interview, Michael Simpson, uh, the creative director, discussed the future of Total War and mentions that someday they would look into importing Total War games onto handheld devices. This was said all the way back in 2006 and then 10 years later, 2016, Rome Total War released on the iPad and again in 2018 for the iPhone and Android. I just found that incredible how they guessed it all the way back then. In addition to this, he states, we could keep producing these games forever, and if you keep making the same game and content over and over again, people get bored eventually. In the past, that has killed other series of games. We don't do that, is what he said on the documentary. And that is what they have been able to avoid, even now. Now there's clear engine crossovers and themes that have been reused, but generally speaking, every game is its own and it keeps the series fresh to this day. Welcome to the first episode of my three part series that looks into the history of Total War. One episode per Sunday for the rest of December. Should be good. This episode focused on their start and early success. Subscribe to get notified of part 2, which will look into the failed launches of Empire and Rome 2 Total War, and the titles in between. Thank you to all the comments on YouTube and Discord that made this video and this series possible. Hope you have enjoyed it, please share with someone or the Discord that you think may be interested, and good bye.